What is meant by the term a narcissistic wound, or even narcissist for that matter? I personally like to keep away from the term itself completely narcissist. I think um, it is misconceived as to the definition. And secondly, who wants to be told, oh, you're a narcissist? In fact, who wants to be told they have any kind of, quote, disorder? Yes, flaw, but a disorder? Here are some thoughts I have now. And these come from uh, time spent in my 20s, for instance, in psychoanalysis and pondering these terms for many years now. So I'll just put out what I think here. As per the term narcissist, many focus on this concept of a, quote, narcissist as someone who lacks empathy. But I'd like to take a look at something very commonplace and uh, see if uh, this resonates or gives some clarity. I'd like to look at the concept of why certain people spend a lot of time on their outward appearance or why a marketer might spend a lot of time um, making the perfect window um, window appearance in a store, a department store, say. You might say, why spend so much time fussing over the optimal lipstick? And so, I like to think humorously, in my mind, of somebody called a narcissist as simply somebody spending a lot of time with their makeup and their outward appearance um, when in fact maybe this is done because there's something not quite so up to snuff under the surface. And so for instance, you can go in a neighborhood that is supposedly quote upscale and yes, the house and the lot that the house is on may run, say, $300,000 or up. And yet, if you look a little deeper, I could give you examples of uh, a community I once lived in where the property was of such valuation. One property had a sports car in the front yard that was there at least two years with uh, at least one mag wheel on it that was flat. Flat for two years. Another was a um, individual with a house, yes, several hundred thousand dollars or up. Uh, and um, he and his wife, a professor, both professors, and yet they have had a broken window uh, wherein the, there is a large gap in it, considerable, for over a year now. And their one vehicle has over 300,000 miles, and they have four children. Other homes, one home of considerable value, yes, probably $300,000 or up, has a lawn that is extremely patchy as per lots of dead spots. So I like to think then of the so-called narcissist as somebody who has applied a lot of lipstick on the outside. But if you look closer, the lipstick may um, not be all it is cracked up to be. Kind of like pulling out a checkbook or wearing a checkbook on your um, belt, so to speak, made of 24 karat gold. And yet, if you were to look inside of it, <laughs> the balance could be below zero. 
Yes, I once spent some time with a couple in a nearby town. They own a business, and they live on a farm of some acreage. And you would think, oh, they must be doing all right for themselves. And yet, I bought them one time a $7 book. It was brand new, and I thought it would be most useful for them, and I'm sure it was. When I wanted to uh, get remunerated for the cost, I was told they didn't have the money. Uh, Their checkbook balance was below zero, and their vehicle, maybe their only vehicle, I don't know, could not go in reverse. And um, at least one of their children had recently been in trouble with the law, and the other, about uh, 10 or 13 years of age, was constantly bullied. So, outward appearances then, like a business there, everything polished up pretty well, um, did not match with what was under the surface, shall we say. And this, I think is not talking at all about a level of empathy, but simply a um, outward appearance that does not match what's under the surface. I used to um, joke to myself that this is a whole lot of window dressing, or again, a whole lot of lipstick. Kind of like uh, going and seeing a clown with a painted-on smile, But you wonder, then, perhaps, what is under that uh, painted-on smile? Why would you paint on a smile? Yes, and otherwise stated, why would you paint on makeup taking two hours, say, a day to put on? Perhaps this is what the psychoanalyst Karen Hornai from the 1920s era or so meant when she talked of the idealized image but she did not say that only some people use an idealized image and not others. But in terms of idealized image, perhaps she was referring to the use of a lot of makeup, lipstick, etc. Covers, shall we say. Kind of like the claim, you should get a good book cover designer and make sure there are no typos in your book. But never is it ever said that the content of your book should be superlative. In fact, quite the opposite is stated. It's stated, uh, who are you to think you could invent a better mousetrap? And so if you can't invent a better mousetrap, you better get a lot of lipstick and apply it to the outside to cover up the fact that you don't have something that is um, worth Uh, talking about from neighbor to neighbor as per the concept of a better mousetrap. You have a mousetrap that won't catch mice, and so let's put on a lot of lipstick on the outside of this mousetrap. Now, I would say, if we have a flaw, and we think a lot of other people might be intolerant of that flaw, then yes, we might want to cover up that flaw with, quote, lipstick, with an outward idealized image, with a claim that because of such and such feature on the outside quite readily apparent, that this flaw on the inside that some really don't like, some might call it toxic, whatever, for whatever reason, is hidden from view, at least in the short run. So we might say to ourselves, well, if I were so open about myself, especially in business, who would buy my product or who would want to marry me, who would want to spend time with me? But perhaps that belies the reality of whether one is accepting of one's flaws or not in the first place, because self-acceptance can go a long way, I believe, in being a trait to be very appealing to others. Otherwise, why would you have some actors, say, who are male, on the silver screen, 
who are either quite short or quite heavy, or have a big nose, and yet are very self-accepting, that very act of self-acceptance is one of their biggest positive traits that greatly um, counteracts the supposed flaws of being, quote, overweight or short, or what have you. Call it even a bunch of wrinkles in older age if female and otherwise termed all washed up. The very act of being able, if possible, to accept a bunch of wrinkles that some would consider a big flaw is a big counter to the supposed flaw. It overwhelms by far this supposed flaw. The very being of honest self-acceptance is a very, very positive trait. And yet many of us, I think, cannot wrap our heads around that to the extent we can't get that far or very far. I'm not exactly sure that I've reached uh, a satisfactory point in this realm myself in all areas, but I do see this uh, issue, I think, in the last few years. But where I see this so-called term narcissist coming into play is to take a flaw, cover it up with a supposedly great asset that states, well, you know, look at this great um, asset and don't look at this flaw that I'm not accepting, by the way, or that I can't accept as part of who I am. Well, then I think the issue becomes, as a, quote, narcissist, one of power-seeking, in which we want to say, perhaps, all too many of us, well, I'm actually better than you, and hence uh, I feel safer in life now that I see this because of such and such trait that I claim is superlative to have in life. I'll give a couple almost ludicrous, humorous examples to illustrate this point. What if somebody one day said to you, I'm better than you are because I sleep every night all alone in bed wearing $100,000 Armani t-shirts and um, underwear in general. In other words, I sleep in $100,000 PJs and you sleep in $2 um, alternative underwear from Walmart or wherever. And so I'm better than you by far. Secondly, and this in the last hundred years, particularly with indoor plumbing, as opposed to the privy on a farm way back. What if somebody said to us, I'm better than you are because my bathroom cost me $100,000 for a makeover? You might say, my bathroom has a lot of lipstick. <laughs> or alternatively, my bathroom says that I'm better than you are by far because the toilet seat is made out of solid 24 karat gold. And I have a maid that comes in, by the way, every day or twice a day and polishes it to get rid of all fingerprints, too. So I'm much better than you are, and thus I feel safer in life. It gives me a sense of power because not only is my toilet seat made out of 24 karat gold, but it has no fingerprints ever. And, you know, of course, no hairs on it either. So I'm better than you are. And boy, do I feel safe then. I think these two instances, if stated, would qualify someone for this term that I don't like using of a supposed narcissist. And I once jotted down and typed out a list of perhaps 20 different things that are commonplace in our society today, oftentimes in any industrialized country, as ways of saying I'm better than you are because I have, in some way, shape, or form, a $100,000 gold toilet seat and you don't. Or I have a $100,000 set of PJs that I wear to bed all alone 
that only the mattress can see and a few bed bugs and you don't. So I'm better than you are. I don't think either of this or any of this is discussing levels of empathy, although you have to wonder what uh, kind of empathy we are having if we're talking about this. But I think um, this so-called term narcissist deals much more with why we would want to do this to feel more powerful. And this talk of, oh, they're non-empathetic, I think is a very secondary issue. And so now, on to part two of this idea. If we were to talk then, as I did, of what we call a, quote, narcissist, or I would call a lipstick expert who uses this to feel safer in life because they claim uh, that their lipstick makes them uh, excel in life as a hot item compared to others who don't have that lipstick, then what about the term of a narcissistic wound? I think typically we may focus only on the concept of how painful it might be for someone to hear that their lipstick isn't all it's cracked up to be. Their $100,000 PJs or 24-karat toilet seat with no fingerprints on it isn't all it's cracked up to be in terms of uh, what they once thought or proclaimed. I think you could call that part one of a, quote, narcissistic wound as per being um, illuminated on that or called upon the carpet on it. But here I would call part two of a so-called narcissistic wound. Again, I don't like the term narcissist, but I just use it because it resonates Uh, you could say lipstick wound. But at any rate, part two, I think, of a painful thing that is even even more of an issue that never gets discussed much is this. And it is, what if our flaws, some say considerable, some not, are termed something we could have done something about and so... We are despicable for not doing what it took to get over it. And secondly, why did it even happen in the first place? We must be uh, in arrears in that area also. I'll give examples. And by giving examples, I bring up yet another concept, that of blame and shame and guilt and so on. There was once a um, show or series of small shows around 2010 uh, on ABC News, I believe, with um, Ann Sawyer, or rather um, Diane Sawyer. I think that's who it was. Who did uh, Children of the Mountains. It was about Appalachia, particularly Kentucky. And At one point, it was talked of how a number of places seemingly had a lot of trash in their yards. And this being discussed, a social worker replied to an interviewer, well, there simply is a lack of resources to pick up the trash to deal with it. Well, what if by trash we're talking flaws in general? Only we're talking at this point the flaws in the yard. And so to be told that the flaws in our lives are due to something like laziness or our being a bum or our not taking responsibility for our lives, our not seeking out help, our shirking things, our being a freeloader, I think all of this states to us that we're some kind of criminal then, that we're culpable for uh, not caring about our impact upon others and uh, seemingly just uh, lollygagging through life and coasting and being a um, target thus for blame. 
even scapegoating. To me, then, that would be kind of a part two of a narcissistic wound, if we're going to call it that, to not only have a flaw, but to be told that you are in arrears for how it happened and for not being able to correct it and correct it quickly and easily and at low cost in general. So yes, whether it's trash in your front yard, as some define it, uh, old automobiles, a washing machine, a yard that isn't so well kept up according to some people's standards, uh, clothing that has phrase on it or doesn't quote match, as per how some people define that. Well, the question then is, are we being accurately told how it came to be and being accurately told why situations can't be improved upon, at least not easily? Um, basically, thus, the concept also being discussed uh are we supposed to be able to pull a rabbit out of a hat or pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? Yes, in the Children of the Mountains, that phrase itself was also brought up, that the poverty-stricken, it was said, should be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, I would say, do they have bootstraps? And are those bootstraps strong enough, etc., and etc.? Is there even such a thing as a self-made man or a woman? You might say thus, can you be born without being conceived by someone else? Are you supposed to be able to be self-born out of thin air, like the concept of how a fire is not able to be started by supposed spontaneous combustion? Are we going to blame something for not happening or not growing because it didn't have the resources to do so or constraints were too strong holding it from happening. To me, that would be kind of a part two then of a narcissistic wound. The first part, to hear once again, we have a flaw that maybe we didn't want to admit we had. Second part, though, is it's your fault. You're a bum. You're lazy because you didn't you allowed that flaw to happen, you made it happen, and you are now not correcting it, too. A very practical example would point out, again, the humorous ludicrousness of some claims. If a soldier, say, came back from a war, missing a limb then, like, let's say, a leg, would you find it ludicrous to say to a soldier, well, you're a bum, because you haven't regrown your leg. Or you're a bum because you can't get back your vision that you lost because you were blinded in an accident. Or you're a bum because you're a cripple after having been shot and uh, your leg shattered or nerves severed. Thus, you're a bum or you're lazy for not fixing the impossible, at least by today's standards. Noting, of course, that some things can come along to change things, like um, an artificial limb being purchased and well-fitted, or uh, a knee replacement obtainable rather easily now and sometimes reliably, when 50 years ago such did not exist. Well, can you, ex can you imagine, too, if there were aliens from a foreign planet landing someday and they were aghast and said to you and me, Oh, you are such a fool. You're such a bum because you don't live to 10,000 years of age like we do on average. Because we have silicon chips we can replace in our brain every hundred years when they wear out. Why don't you have those silicon chips? You must be lazy for not figuring out and Im implanting these chips like we have. Well, we would say in response, if smart and courageous, that I didn't have the time and the energy and the knowledge, etc., 
to make those chips, maybe in a thousand years. So who are you to say that? I don't have the resources and I'm quite limited. I'm constrained. So go take a hike and go back to your spaceship, we might say. And yet, in other aspects of life, we hear all too often, perhaps, a blaming of us as per a claim that we can pull a rabbit out of a hat to fix flaws as well as um, being blamed for them happening in the first place or existing. I would say even thus, what is a flaw? Is it a flaw thus to not be able to live to 10,000 years of age? Or is that simply biology? Is it a flaw that we don't have 10 arms and 10 legs, kind of like a Medusa, uh, if you remember photos of a creature with many arms and legs. It's kind of like an amoeba. So that you can write 10 times as fast and create 10 times as many books and make 10 times as much money. Or hold 10 times as many microphones and speak on 10 different times more venues and again make 10 times the money. Well, that's kind of hard to grow 10 times as many limbs, isn't it? We don't have the resources and there are too many biological constraints in general. Hence it would be, if bought into, a narcissistic wound, I would say, part two, to believe something concerning flaws that are our fault, supposedly. I'll give yet another example. A year ago, I was traveling traveling in eastern Kentucky in Appalachia in a small town of 2,000. And I went to a um, little cafe at 7 in the morning and had an omelet, enjoying myself. And the news was playing on a TV set. And the governor was being interviewed. And somebody was claiming that COVID was the governor's fault for existing because he wasn't doing enough to fix COVID. And then he was trying to reply, of course, (laughs) that that's impossible, that he could fix COVID. But wouldn't it be all the more, quote, insulting or a narcissistic wound if he were told and he bought into a claim that he must be a bum or a loser or irresponsible Or he must be a slackard. He must be lazy. He must be shirking his duties for not fixing COVID. For not thus pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Some might even say, well, you should have been working on COVID till midnight every night. Well, what if he didn't have the resources to do that? Or what if he was constrained by other duties in life? At any rate, he did not buy the Kool-Aid on that accusation. If he did, I think we could term him to have had a narcissistic wound, part two, for thinking he could have prevented COVID and could now fix it. And in short order, too. Maybe in 10,000 years he could fix it uh, as per one incident of, of life, but not now. I think we went round and round, too, in our country uh, regarding Patty Hearst and a robbery whereupon she was, um, by all appearances, coerced into participating and later said she should not be considered culpable in a court of law because she had no choice in the matter. Likewise, in a courtroom, some people are exonerated from being called a criminal by way of a defense of insanity. You might say, um, arguably, uh, not guilty of a crime because you're an infant, too. Um, is Is an infant culpable in a court of law for most anything? Or a person of 110 years of age who can no longer see or hear? or barely walk. 
They're lacking resources and they're very constrained. To be told something and then believe it to the contrary for a 110-year-old person to be told they're lazy because they can't do any farming anymore or um, clean up the house would be, if believed, a narcissistic wound, part two, I would say. But unfortunately, even in our legal jurisprudence system, we are sometimes told all too often, if uh, processed into a criminal uh, warehouse, shall we say, that uh, you deserve whatever punishment under the phrase, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. In other words, you should be able to fix all your flaws and do the impossible and avoid all problems in life. And if you don't, it's your fault. Yet another example. I have a good friend uh, who a year ago told me that an in-law of his who is, say, 40 years younger uh, was irresponsible for having overworked despite a physician's holding him, a physician's holding him he was overworking upon which this in-law had a stroke and uh, was semi-crippled, lost part of his leg, uh, and now the claim being that the father-in-law had to spend money and time to help this individual. The person having had the stroke was claimed to be basically irresponsible for it happening. I suppose in some circles it would be carried even further to say it's irresponsible that you were hit by a comet on top of the head one day because you didn't wear a helmet at all times to prevent being injured from some comet hitting you upside the head. So to basically recap, I think it's quite possible the concept of narcissism, first of all, is a derogatory term. And secondly, the concept of narcissism, I think, all too much focuses on supposed lack of empathy, uh, when in fact, I'd say, a much bigger issue is one of the su supposed narcissist as someone taking some trait or something owned, or something achieved, and making this um, front and center as a claim to be better than someone else, to feel more powerful and thus safe. Uh, and it's, yes, typically a shell game, because on the inside someone is feeling very insecure, very powerless over a lack of something or a perceived lack. Often, the biggest lacking being not the flaw, but the uh, shame over it, the lack of acceptance of it. In other words, why cover up wrinkles unless you felt wrinkles were something awful and you didn't accept wrinkles as a part of life? Or why feel ashamed, so to speak, of slowing down as per how fast you can walk in older age. And so I think the, quote, narcissistic part is not so much at all a lack of empathy. Uh, that's, that's an issue, yes, but um, an issue of power and the claim that because I have these $100,000 PJs, these Armani PJs and you don't, I'm better than you, and so I feel more powerful, and I thus feel safer. I have armor, so to speak. But part two of this whole issue is uh, being blamed, so to speak, for the flaw happening or existing, and then it not being corrected. 
when in fact, did we have the ability to um, prevent the flaw, the lack of something in the first place, and the resources and lack of constraints to do anything about it? I think finally, it strikes to the core of the whole word handicap and how we define handicaps. And in fact, are some things that some people say are handicaps actually great assets because they can be thorns in the side to promote tremendous growth and thus create something magnificent? You might say, in a sense, some people who have a big flaw compared to some work on that flaw until it becomes alternatively the opposite, their greatest strength. Kind of like if a house burnt to the ground and someone says, well, I'm going to rebuild a Taj Mahal on the same spot or something magnificent where it was once not so at all. Or the challenge in life, shall we say, stimulating us to great levels of courage and uh, advocacy uh, in certain avenues and the promoting of ourselves as a great philosopher of sorts, with no degrees, by the way. Without these thorns in the side then, these weaknesses, as some call them, compared to others, where would the growth come from? Where would the impetus come from to do more than just coast? To be in a comfort zone all the time. But more to the point, I would say, how are we to define a handicap unless we're just defining it in comparative terms to our neighbors, say, or those on this planet at any rate, or in our country? For you might say all of us are handicapped because we can't fly unless we're on an airplane. Or we're all handicapped because we can't live to 10,000 years of life or live forever. So, boy, are we all handicapped compared to some people, you might say. Only we don't feel handicapped because we have not seen somebody in front of us, only theoretically, live to 10,000 years of age. So we don't call ourselves handicapped. We don't call ourselves handicapped, too, because we don't have 10 arms and 10 legs and thus can write 10 times as much or hold 10 times as many microphones. And we don't call ourselves handicapped because we don't need to sleep. And yet uh, there are animals who only sleep an hour a day, perhaps. That might be some whales, for instance, if I remember. And we don't call ourselves handicapped because uh, that one computer, was it um, Big Blue, started to beat out the greatest chess masters in the world reliably or more and more. We don't call ourselves thus handicapped because we're not robots. Basically speaking, we're not computers. We take pride, in fact, that we are not computers. We don't call ourselves handicapped compared to a computer. We just are. And so I think thus, this is part of the essence of self-acceptance or as it ties in thus to accepting our flaws and not feeling so much strife trying to hide them and excuse them away. We don't call our supposed flaws, our essence, a handicap. In fact, we don't often even address them as limitations, but um, prods in the side for growth, perhaps. I love this one example from a man named Einzelganger in the Netherlands who has a uh, YouTube channel and he put out one day a little seven minute or so video on the virtues of being ugly and um, I emailed him once and he responded he considers himself ugly because he's short and that he couldn't get dates then often as a uh, younger person and that he's so happy now because he was able to plow the time that he had on hand then, not dating all the time, to grow and later create this wonderful show, this channel on YouTube. 
So the supposed thorn in the side of a shortness-based handicap, as some would call it, or ugliness, as some would call it, turned out to be the best thing going for him in the long run, he claims. And even thus, what are we to call a handicap or ugliness? If we had more self-acceptance thus of the reality of what comes to be, why, why it often isn't changeable, like if you're short, how are you supposed to grow a foot or two on your own? Unless you wear elevator shoes. Or if you're blind, how are you supposed to get back your vision and easily? On and on and on. Self-acceptance meaning simply understanding how the flaws came to be and why they're not easily, if ever, changeable, at least in the short run, and given existing resources. That, to me, is self-acceptance and um, understanding of what a flaw really is defined to be often basically fallacious, a flaw, a handicap, a reality. Are we thus flawed? Are we handicapped for being human beings in general? Do we consider thus ourselves handicapped because we're not, quote, gods? And then we try to cover this over with a lot of lipstick, call it um, to feel powerful. Maybe if we felt more self-accepting of our limitations, we wouldn't need to feel uh, the need. We wouldn't feel so powerless. These then are my thoughts then on the concept of, quote, narcissism and, quote, narcissistic wounds and uh, as per what I think now.